Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to your Thursday night instalment of SPTV live from the UK with my guest, who is very PTS because he had technical issues. Let's blame it on the BTs, Mitch Brisker. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Totally. Totally BTS. <laughs> How are you doing, hey, Mitch? Hey, How's great it going? To see you, great to see you, Alex. Thanks for asking me back. Uh, just a little warning. Any second my dog's going to start barking, I'm going to have to let him in, but so. That's absolutely people are used fine. to that on my channel. They're like, they want me to pick him up and show him. And like, you do need to get your dog on camera at some point. I, I have a couple of times, and I did an ending with him, which people love. I did. I have an outro. I don't know if you've seen it, but yes, uh, barking at a bug. Yeah, barking at a bug. The Osa bug. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, my that. mic is a little far away. Sorry about that. Is that better? That's better. Much better. So okay. Sorry about that. Guys, to give you I might a bit not of, be all yeah. I'm old, but I'm slow. Okay, so it's okay. It's Sorry right. about that. Let's... We're here together. It's not yeah, a what problem. do you want to talk about today, Alex? Um, well, we are here to talk about the ideal org program. So, I was watching an interview that Mitch was doing with Chris Shelton the other day about something different, and they dropped in there and started a mention of the ideal org program. And I had no idea that Mitch was so involved in this from a design wow. architecture planning perspective and i was like mitch we need to talk about this because for those of you who don't know outside of youtube i uh, work in marketing i'm a freelancer and i work with architects and designers on commercial interior spaces right. with clients like gensler who is the one of the largest architecture firms in the world who are the ones behind scientology's ideal org program so i thought look we need to get on and let's talk about this um before we do uh please go and subscribe to mitch if you're watching on my channel give us a thumbs up a like and a subscribe and a comment it helps push the video out to more people um and if you want to support us we both have links where you can buy us coffees um and all of that sort of stuff but mitch do you want to give us a bit of a background into what the ideal org program is first off well i think uh there's a couple of different versions it's, it's almost difficult to pinpoint where it started but some people say that it goes back to uh the buffalo org in uh, buffalo new york where the the org was uh it was taken over the property was claimed by the city under a imminent domain because they needed it for a city planning project you know they they bought, ended up i'm sure paying handsomely for it and then the the, the Miscavige bought a new building, dirt cheap. And because there was all of a sudden this opportunity to create a new building, it brought two things to light. One of those things was, well, three things actually. The buildings looked horrible. Scientology churches, for the most part, really looked bad. I mean, you had, you know, like walk ups over a bait shop or something next door to a strip bar or just they were unseemly. And, and because one of the world's biggest movie stars had just become, you know, was now Miscavige's best friend and was very eager to start bringing his, his uh, cohorts, uh, you know, his peers into the churches. It was like a real problem. So you had that. Then you had the fact that David Miscavige does, he doesn't like or trust uh, the staff at the churches to actually talk about Scientology. He's sure that they're going to screw it up. I mean, Scientology has traditionally, uh, in the old days, it became successful because of two things, word of mouth, and because the organizations had really good lecturers, uh, like people that could do lecturers. And uh, Miscavige like, killed that. Like, it, it, like the idea that some person that wasn't under his direct control was going to go explain Scientology was horrible. So he wanted to start installing audio video systems in, in what's called Div 6, which is the public facing part of the org. It's the part where they get in new people. So he created this project, it was called the Buffalo Project. And to, you know, to really upgrade the building, it wasn't a real plan other than let's upgrade the building, make it nice, put in a bunch of videos that explain dynamic Scientology so we don't have to rely on our, you know, on our ridiculous, uh, you know, our untrustworthy staff. I mean, literally he once said to me, you know, what about a kid who's like joined staff after two weeks and he's like, a you know, 18 year old kid and, you know, so, and, and, and he knows nothing. And somebody comes in and asks him what Scientology is. It's going to be a disaster. So they did that. It was called, like I said, it was called the Buffalo Project. Then it advanced to 
they, they opened a church in Tampa. That was kind of the next one. It was like, let's upgrade this one. Uh, he's, you know, and Miscavige had this idea, let's send in, you know, he sent in two of his hench, hench, hench people, uh, Jenny Linson and I, I can't think of the other woman's name. And let's like get the local parishioners to pay for a building. That's a very important part of the ideal work program. And it's kind of an idea that he, uh, he, he was inspired by the Mormons who basically get their parishioners uh, to, to pay for churches. Now, I warned you, give me one second. I got to let the dog in. It's fine. While you're doing that, I'm going to um, show people some examples. So this here is what the Birmingham uh, Church of Scientology used to look like. It was this little door here in the middle of two shops. Um, I've actually been there. I remember visiting when I was on staff. Um, and you go through this little door and you go upstairs and the Church of Scientology was one of these floors above yeah. this building. Yeah. And they then uh, raised money to um uh, buy a new building uh at, which has recently opened and this is the new birmingham church of scientology which is the whole building that's all ideal um so that's what we mean by the ideal org program is turning these old buildings that are just small maybe above a shop type thing that are looking a bit run down big fundraising campaign to buy a fancy new building or quite often in the right. uk it's an old um listed building with some sort of heritage component uh, and spending millions on refurbishing it and opening so that scientology has this fancy plush new building and it kind of you know puts scientology in a better light and it's like look we're expanding we've opened a new church and um right. london org was one of the first ones 2006 um, right that, that was and they had the they have we'll get into it but i'm just going to ask you before we explain it to them they had the public displays in 2006 uh yeah yeah, yeah wow yeah i, I thought I, I i didn't remember we'd finished it that early but it started anyway we'll get into that but it started not long before that but yeah yeah i mean i just i have to really stress that this whole program i mean Scientology expansion became measured in square footage. It switched. Ms. Cabbage switched it. It used to be auditing hours, people that new people coming into Scientology, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, expansion became measured in square footage, and that became a big deal. But I just I can't stress how much it was driven by the, the standard became, can Tom Cruise bring his associates into this building? Will they be impressed? And can I have some kind of a self-guided tour or enough audiovisual tools where people can walk in and push a button. I mean, Miscavige was always saying that he wanted things push button, like favorite terms, push button, or just add water, you know? So he, he didn't want to leave it to the, to the, the, what had in the past driven the success, which was very passionate people doing lectures and doing word of mouth and so forth. So uh, that's kind of how the whole thing got going. And and that uh, anecdote there about Tom Cruise wasn't. I don't want to gloss over that because that wasn't just a, a jokey comment. Like you are no, hundred no, 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 percent no, no, serious no. when you no, say no, no, no. I I, I can I, I have I have firsthand knowledge of that. It wasn't. It, yeah, sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut. I just I get you know I'm an excitable boy, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's true. I just wanted to say, like you just said, it's it's not just an anecdote. Tom Cruise. No. Um, and his opinion on Scientology is what drove this campaign, which I don't think has been talked about before. I've no, and you that. know, I, I, it's not. I, I mean, how can I explain this without seeming like I'm a sort of some kind of apologist? But it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, like you want to move up in the world. Like, if you're gonna become upwardly mobile, you need to start maybe dressing better. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. It's not a bad thing. It's just um, it's it, it 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 was such a motivating factor. I mean, there needed there really needed to be a raised standard of what a church is, and it just so happened that coincidentally, Tom, who's you know lives a super wealthy rock you know movie star, everything around him is very. It's very top of the line. Uh, so, you know, he couldn't exactly bring people in to see churches. I mean, the same could be said of the films that I went up there to change. I mean, one of the reasons I had to change it, it was so important to get them redone. They were so horrible, and Tom was a filmmaker. So it was just embarrassing for him to look at those films. Mm. Does anybody and want a dog? 
<laughs> Why are you crying? Um, and what you're saying about the the emphasis on on Tom Cruise is true. Like it, it's all about the facade, right? If you walk in, if you're trying to prove that Scientology is a religion, um, and all of the buildings are shabby, old, horrible looking little mall store right, type things, right. it doesn't, you know. But if it doesn't have that much gravitas, but if you're applying for religious status or tax exemption, you go, look, right. we're a real church. We have right. a grand building that's been right. refurbished, and it's like um, really carefully looked after and you know it's it feels religious because it has that sense of grandiose right right and and, and, and yeah it's history yeah right? and if you look at religious spaces regardless of you know they're all different from each each one to one but you know they have a torah they have a a, 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 a thing that points to the west for praying to allah they have a buddha each one of them has these i kind of iconic images these iconic uh, artifacts that really make it feel like a church. There's the crucifixion, there's the stained glass, and all Scientology had was a bust of L. Ron Hubbard and a photo of L. Ron Hubbard and a cashier. So <laughs> it was like, but then literally they had registers and desks and then there's some rooms, but whatever. And so they needed to sort of create yeah. like that kind of space. Um, and let's just give you some some visual context. So this is um, a very old video on the Scientology uh, YouTube channel. That's a tour of the Church of Scientology. London. We won't watch the whole thing because it is very okay. boring, but we'll skip through it and okay. skip the promo type stuff. I'll be listening. Yeah, sure. So this is so in, in London, there are two buildings. There is the test centre on Tottenham Court Road, which is this one here. And then there's the main ideal org at 146 Victoria Street near Blackfriars. Now, this org here is the one very famously that um, Mike Rinder was standing in the doorway talking to journalist John Sweeney. Um, defending Dave Miscavige, saying uh, he didn't personally beat me up and it's all lies and so on. And that conversation is what sparked Mike Rinder to think, uh, you know, maybe I need to get out of here and I need to leave. Right. So that's this building here. Um, uh, and I'll just play you a few set. seconds so you can see. All five stories are devoted to providing a full introduction area. to both Dianetics and Scientology. To that end, this center hosts a public... And then this is what Mitch is talking about with the public information center. So I spent a lot of time in this building and would body route people in, which means give out leaflets and try and get them to come in to, you know, learn about Scientology. And we would sit them down in front of one of these screens um, and we would say, hey, watch this uh, short two minute video, press play. And then it kind of uh, it explains very basically what Scientology or what Dianetics is, whichever video is appropriate for that person. Information exhibit covering every fundamental belief and practice so that's that one there on the left is the dianetics um booth which is the one we led most people to because we wanted to sell that book and then on the right hand side um is the scientology screen which is all about um uh, the purification rundown and the scientology spiritual stuff and then behind that um is a screen about elron hubbard his life um and then there's a little bookstore in there as well but this is what to better the building looks like now they ha don't deliver courses in the Tottenham court road uh building anymore these rooms were always empty when i was there um and mostly just used for storage and then this yeah. is the main london org building where i used to work and had my office regard visitors are welcome so you can see it's very grand and they spend a lot of money and care and attention on refurbishing it um here, look, the sort of level of detail here. It's a listed building, right? And then this yeah, is the it, public it, information center at the yeah. main org. So you see it's much bigger. But this is where if you go for a tour of the church, this is what you get toured around is the public yeah. information center. Yeah, this would be the only church in the world that has a receptionist. So, yeah. <laughs> which is, it's just so designed like a business. It's not even funny. Um, yeah, these were referred to as Miscavige referred to these as statement buildings. In other words, you find a building that in and of itself made a statement. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just spare no expense. I'm trying to think, did you happen to find any of Gensler's credits? I mean, these guys, they've designed airports. They've probably done half the hotels in Vegas, uh, Dubai. Uh, you know, they probably did half of Dubai. I mean, these guys, major credits. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and so, they're so huge. 
Yeah, so Gensler is a worldwide architecture firm that are one of the largest in the world. They design huge buildings, airports and so on. Um, you, Anyone who um, is familiar with famous landmark buildings will, will probably be able to identify at least a couple that Gensler have designed. And Gensler are the architects behind Scientology's Ideal Org program. Now, a lot of people think that a lot of the orgs are designed in-house and all of that, and it's done by the Sea Org, um, and Genza just signed it all off but you actually mentioned on the interview with Chris Shelton the other day that um that that wasn't the case right Genza no. designed everything they did it all and then all that was done in-house was oh the, yeah the, yeah the I mean when I okay so when I was working on the Div6 displays that public information we can talk about that more in detail but uh because I mean I spent a year and a half building the ideal Div6 inside the, the, the film studio at Gold. And the reason we had to do that is because nobody knew what everything was that went in there. I mean, you showed that picture. Nobody knew what that was. What goes in there and how big does it have to be? Hubbard said that the public division needs to be one third of the org, needs to be occupied, that, um, occupied by the public division. That's one of the other things that we didn't mention. Take a place like Celebrity Center before the Idea Org pro program, you couldn't find the Division Six. At, you, 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 literally, unless you had a floor plan and a guide, you would never find it. It was it was two little teeny rooms in the back of the first floor, and it, the Div Six was it, the public division was supposed to be the big grand entrance. So we, I spent a year and a half building the thing, and then I had to turn it over to Gensler so, because then they uh, they adapted it to each church. But so my my you know, uh, interaction with it, my involvement in it w was that. So then when I was when meeting with Gensler and a guy named Erwin Miller, who was the VP of Gensler in LA, he was the chief architect on the whole project. And as you know, uh, from working with our, uh, the chief architect is what they call the main guy. Whoever is the head guy on a project, he's called, anyway, Miller was the head project, the head architect on that. And I went out to meet with them on some, some public display stuff. They had offices in Santa Monica. They had 70 people devoted to the ideal work problem. It was an entire floor. Like it was a massive project. And most of those people had never even seen a Scientology book or been inside. They were just designing spaces and they had some standards and so forth. And you know, but they didn't just do the orgs. I mean, they did the ship, they redid the ship, they they did Scientology Media Productions, which is really a beautiful facility so they, they they did a lot of stuff oh yeah and we're talking millions and millions of dollars here and i always wonder why gensler um are taking on this project because you know well but you just said it because there was well, millions and millions of dollars so. you say. they're not they're not scientologists but um gensler kind of have an easy deal here because there are clients in the architecture world that are pain in the backside and really specific and annoying about certain details and so on right. um and go back and forth and the design process takes ages um I, putting myself in gensler's shoes search scientology come along and go hey we've got buttloads of money and we will pay you probably above market rate to do this right. stuff for us right um, and actually we kind of have really specific requirements as to how these buildings work and what they look like so we're going to do a lot of the work anyway um and then you need to give us your expertise in how to actually do that so it's right. an easy job for Gensler because the space yeah. planning things like working out how much space is needed for div six and the information displays all of that right. stuff is done in house so for an architect it's quite an easy job and it's a lot of money so i can see why they've taken it on um but i don't think it's necessarily public knowledge i mean scientology have quoted Erwin Miller, for example, in Freedom Magazine. Um, there's a quote here about his um, design work for the Scientology Media Productions project. And it says, Erwin Miller, the lead designer of the SMP project at design firm Gensler, noted the professional oversight, blah, blah, blah. And there's a quote from him talking about the level of experts and restoration of the old historic building. And right, so right, right, right. I told you talk about it, but you won't find anything on Gensler's website about it because no, I think. The, I searched high and low. They, they. Yeah. No mention, no mention anywhere. I mean, they just, you know, I, I think the other thing, speaking to what a good deal it was for them, they probably, I'll bet you that they didn't pay over market. I'll bet you they paid a competitive price because they were given so many projects. Like they were probably given 20 projects at once. 
And, you know, in the world of architecture, it's valuable to be able to manage your future as far in the future as possible. Yeah, let me just correct myself. It's lead architect, not chief architect. When you hear the term lead architect, that's the guy in charge. Yes, yeah, so. absolutely. And I reached out to Gensler. I have quite a good working relationship with them um, and know quite a lot of people in the design team, in the architecture uh -huh. team, and also in their media relations team. And um, I asked them to provide a comment on the mm -hmm. Scientology relationship. Uh, specifically, I said, um, I understand Gensler have a long standing relationship with Scientology. And I was wondering if you could provide a statement um, about your relationship with the church. In particular, I'm interested to learn any interesting facts or figures about the superpower building um, and any current or future projects you may have in the pipeline with the church. Um, and then I asked separately to that, um, I'd like to also know what Genza's views are on the allegations of abuse and human trafficking and the current lawsuits going on with Dave Miscavige and what um, considerations are in place and due diligence to ensure Genza don't work with criminal organizations. Um, <laughs> that wasn't precocious of you at all. Well, Gensler um, weren't able to publicly comment on any of that yeah, because of their not. policy essentially is, no, we don't talk about our clients that are confidential and private and so on. Um, and so they didn't provide any comment whatsoever uh, that I can share publicly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah exactly so, so they're um, aware of the risk and they work with these major clients around the world and i think what must be interesting um is scientology's project of expansion and these ideologues and so on um because the parishioners have to pay for their own renovations and purchasing of the building around the world really? there are hundreds of buildings that have been bought that are just sat there empty um waiting to be refurbished because there aren't enough people or enough dollars to do that refurbishment project for example yeah, yeah there is they had three billion dollars in the bank they could do it but i mean within their own local yeah, system, and getting right? their parishioners to do it their local bishops which are in scientology are called ot ambassadors yes but the corollary and any other they would be the like in the mormon religion they'd be the bishops they'd be the guys you know, trying to hold the line in the local area. So uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, the thumbnail of this, if you were watching this on my channel, the thumbnail actually includes a picture of Manchester Org. I wrote an article about it on my website, ScientologyBusiness.com. Um, they bought this building 16 years ago, um, and it has literally been sat there empty uh, and crumbling and ready for refurbishment. And nothing has been done in the way of refurbishing this building. It was actually very close to compulsory purchase from the local government just before uh, the pandemic because uh, they wanted, the, the government were annoyed that this building is sat there empty and hasn't been refurbished. So they were like, look, we need, we're gonna buy this building back off you if you don't start renovating right now. Um, and then they got a minor extension because of the pandemic and so on. But this is the state of Scientology's ideal orgs. Yeah, but I, I, this one exactly, that's, that's how some of them look. I don't know that that one was so much about money as it was about they don't have a strategy in that area because that area is a disaster in terms of any public that might interact with it or, or staff that need staff. They need public. I mean, you know, I, they could easily pay for the building, but then yeah. it would be even worse. Yeah, it's a shame. I mean, I, you know. I You know, they just need to turn those all those orgs into homeless shelters and just like say they're sorry and you know what people would start going being interested in scientology if they did yeah. that if yeah, they apologized absolutely. and said we have empty buildings and we're going to house the homeless and, and you know people and go, that's oh. quite a churchly activity that's the sort of thing you would expect a church to yeah. do is help the yeah, local yeah, homeless like, community yeah like it blows my mind the catholic church provides 25 percent of all health care on the entire planet earth 25 well, percent of the health care is provided by catholic organizations i'm a lot of them are in poor emerging countries but still i mean it's like you go and you give some money on sunday at a catholic church and it's probably going to go to heal some help some kid you know in some poor nation so but it's just like in scientology they're going to just hire pis to come and make sure that i'm behaving yeah. myself Absolutely. Yes, sorry about De that. Denver Stevo has a really good question actually here. Thank you for the super chat. He says, what is the excuse for Denver Ideal Org? The old American radiator company building isn't all that impressive except for being old. It's not really a statement building, is it? 
Yeah, I don't know what the building looks like, but it, it, I, I have a feeling that some of these buildings they bought are not statement, quote unquote, statement buildings. But they have to be a certain size and sort of. Yeah, I mean, the, we established when we built the public division, when we did that whole thing, we established that an ideal space would be 20,000 square feet. And at, so th two thirds of that would be 60,000 square feet. So that was the target size. But then they ranged anywhere from 40 to like 80. And then whoever was doing the space, uh, originally Gensler did all the space planning. And then after a while, the, what's called the landlord's office, which is the office, a part of the church uh, under Miscavige's direct control, which own, basically uh, uh, controls the buildings and do, they do the space planning and, and, and so forth, but they're not, I don't think they've ever taken the designs over. Hey, let me just, can I just jump over? Can you, can I answer this question? Mitch, uh, Blow Drill. Yeah. Blow Drill want, had an interesting question. It's just a little bit of an aside, but it's, it's about, did you ever work with the architects that designed? Did you see that one? So a little back a little uh, bit. Yeah, I'll find it. I'll find it. Yeah, he asked, did you ever work with the architects that designed all the Yellow Ridge homes for the archival buildings? Those are actually called the heritage homes, and those are all the homes where L. Ron Hubbard lived or supposedly lived. Uh, and I did work on one of them. Uh, and though I was asked to work on more, but I kind of avoided it. I worked on the one, the one that was actually Joseph, what's his name? Uh, uh, Campbell, the, 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 editor, the guy who was the astounding magazine editor who lent Hubbard his house while he wrote Tyanetics. Uh, J.W. Campbell, I think was his name. And, uh, yeah, they designed the whole thing. It's I, I don't know who actually did the designs. I never asked. I went to the landlord's office. I saw the design boards, and apparently they got in a reject because it looked like a museum. It didn't look like a home, which is a real you know. Th th it just you just have to prop it like it's a movie set. Like oh, he gave lectures in here. Okay, so put like twenty folding chairs and line them up and lean them against the wall. Fold them up and lean. You know, like do little things. So it was nothing. It was that was like money for nothing. I got to tell you, because that was just like. Uh, but yeah, I worked on that one, and I was going to work for more, but then I I got the heck out of there. Can uh, you talk us through a bit of that design process? Because um, you know you were there when the uh, Dave Miscavige came up with this idea. He, you, you've already told us that he did it because he wanted to improve Tom Cruise, and you mentioned that you built a mock up in the film studio. Can yeah. you talk us through that process? Because yeah, when you talked so, before well, yeah. you went live, you mentioned the industry of death museum and how that all started. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, there was this period starting with Buffalo and then going through Tampa, and I think maybe London, San Francisco, whatever. Uh, but I guess it did, I guess by the time they did London, that was Gensler, right? That must have been they must have been on board then. So basically, but in terms of the whole dip, him, he put a whole stop to the buying buildings because the whole public division thing and what the public were supposed to see, in, 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 instead of having staff explain stuff to them, like that was such an unknown that it was causing problems. So he put the brakes on buying any new buildings until he could figure out what size to buy them which is really part of a devious plan because remember he's trying to sell this to parishioners to raise money. And so the big solution has to be when we bring people in and they see this new division six with these displays, boy, they're going to sign up. I mean, he found a genie. He just had to rub the bottle and pull out, bah, the genie would come out and people would just be pouring in. Never happened. But so I went into the castle, the city castle, it had these massive, Hallways, you know, big enough you could drive a Mini Cooper down one of those hallways. The Cine Castle is the film studio. Yeah, the big, the big film right? studio. Yeah, and it, yeah. The, the actual space for shooting is about, I don't know, 22,000 square feet, but the whole building is, I think it's about 80,000 square feet. And so the order was, yeah, go in there and build. So I went in there one day, and in the hallways, there was all these easels set up, and they use those hallways a lot for this kind of stuff. And on all the easels, was photos of all the orgs, and Miscavige walked me through the photos, and they were, he was like, these are horrible. They're ugly. They're disgusting. I mean, he's just like just going on a roll and we need to replace all these buildings. And he said, like, I can't have Tom take his people to any of these buildings. So it's not like nobody's I'm not guessing when I say that. I mean, like there was like literally told to me and I'm like, yeah, I get it. I'm I'm uh, yeah, I'm as embarrassed as you are. I mean, I wasn't because I didn't. I don't know. I have different compartments. That's a whole nother story. Um, <laughs> you know, I lived in one compartment and worked in another but um, so yeah, that's how the whole thing got going, but just to back. So then 
just prior to that, we had done, uh, it, it was my a project that I oversaw, which was the Industry of Death Museum. Did you have, do you have that website? Uh, I can get it up. Yeah, it's called, it's a virtual tour. You have to search virtual tour. So what was wanted was a self-guided tour. There was basically 13 themed ideas, 13 displays. Each one would have a video that needed to be written and produced and blah, blah, blah. The whole thing needed to be designed. But most importantly, it needed to be a self-guided tour where a person could just go in, the, the, the big video monitor and a big play button, and they could hit the play button, and they could watch the video, and they could move on to the next one. And if there were a lot of people, they, they could wear headphones and hear the audio portion, like going through a museum, right? So we did that, and it seemed to work really well. I'm lagging a little bit. Forgive me. I'll get it worked out. Uh, and then Miscavige said, wow, we need a, that's what we need. We need a self-guided tour for Div 6. And so this industry of death, that's, that's the opening. Yeah, that's my padded cell. That's the first. Okay, so if, if you then just walk in there, you'll yeah, just go straight forward. You'll see, straight forward, you'll see origins, and there'll be a monitor there. It's a really scary place. If you're in L.A., go, but just don't take children because um, it's like, it should be like a, there you go. That's it. So you see that you've got a couple of really, and there's a, a, a play button. See that thing right there, the blue thing. You've got this play button where you can navigate and start over, turn the volume up and down. Really simple. And people would walk through it and you wouldn't go through it with anybody. You know, VIPs, they do tour VIP tours and stuff. But you know, normally if you walked in there and you know, give them a fake name and I recommend you go in there because it's, it's really got a lot of cool stuff in it. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time doing. I, I lost a lot of sleep on that building. So, um, so I, I need bet. people. I need people to go and appreciate it. So anyway, that was the prototype. The industry of death was the prototype for the self-guided tour that then became the D Division Six displays, right? Which you showed those lovely displays in the in the London facility uh, church. We just like dressed it. It just kind of reconfigured it. So that was basically, then we just started designing this thing with, and figuring out what the video should be and how many, how many screens there would be and where would you would store all the ancillary material and all this kind of crazy stuff. And then once that was done, it, I mean, we put everything in there. We put film rooms. We even put toilets. So we had to put signs on them. Please, you know, not working toilet because everything looked so real. <laughs> we were worried somebody would go in there and like, you know, go, oh, I'll just use this toilet, you know, and then we'd have a big mess. Around. <laughs> but we had every, everything was in there. 20, it was 20,000 square feet. And that's what then became, then the light that was like, oh, so the building size would be 60,000 feet. And then they could start mm. buying buildings again. Like that. So yeah. how was the relationship with Gensler formed? Do you know? Like, did, did it go I out don't to don't actually. I don't because actually know. I, often, when a big company, like I always use Google as the example, like if they want to open a new office building, right, they will speak to a number of different architects to get oh, their yeah. opinions and their ideas yeah, before that, selecting that, the one to proceed yeah, with. They'll and put it out for the bid. Contract. You know that. Yeah, and exactly. The architectural, the architectural firm might spend a million dollars preparing so, material for the bid if it's a big enough project. So I wonder if that happened, that process happened for Scientology, or whether they just approached a couple and they were turned down and Gensler were the only I, ones that I, said I, yes. I, you know, I don't actually know, and I never asked, but I would assume it was the latter. I'm assuming mm. that they would just, you know, they would just put it out for a bid, kind of. They put out feelers, and Gensler mm. the ones that, I mean, Gensler was really <laughs> engaged. I mean, Erwin Miller was, uh, he, he, he showed up at fundraising events, and he was a darling of the OT committee set. And it was like he was a celebrity, literally. Like he was the guy that designed the orgs. He was the public face of the whole thing. Uh, you know, this is the guy that designed the ship. And this is the guy that, you know, he, he'd come to events with his, his wife and his kids. He's a great guy, super talented. I mean, the guy. But not a Scientologist. No, 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 no. And of course, they never asked him because they knew what the answer would be. So mm -hmm. it was just like... Um, yeah, it's just like when you sent them that question, I'm surprised I didn't send you back a little note that said, hey, dude, we picked the colors. That's all we did. So because <laughs> uh, yeah. I think if I was them, that's what I would have said. So I don't know what they're, I mean, I don't know how involved they are with them anymore because the ideal org problem is like, 
you know, it's just slow to a stop, right? It's completely stalled. Well, also, a, a lot of the, the work architects do is think people think of architecture as, you know, the building and construction, but that's the last <laughs> phase of a project. Yeah, so yeah. The, the majority of work architects do um, happens for years and years prior to them even breaking ground. They have to do, um, you know, ground samples and testing and analysis. They have to design the building, put it through structural engineers, and it's a mathematical yeah. thing, but also a design process. Process. They get to learn the clients, the way they operate, what the building needs to do. And it's a design process that takes years. Right, the right. moment it gets on site and they start building, then actually that's usually a separate division of the architects um, that run the project management of, of actually building it. Because the design yeah. work is what the architects do that takes a large amount of time. And I imagine a lot of that work has already been done. Because buildings like Manchester, for example, yeah. they were designed. They're ready to go. They just haven't yeah. started actually constructing the building yet. Yeah, um, no, you're, you're absolutely right about that. So I imagine yeah. Genza don't have much of a relationship with Scientology at the moment because there's such a backlog of buildings waiting to open yeah, <laughs> that were and, designed uh, probably 20 years ago. Yeah, and yeah, and Erwin Miller has his, he's gone from Gensler. He doesn't work in Scientology. I don't know who does. And I know the last time I had inter interaction with the architect's office, well, it's not the architect's office, it's called the landlord's office, where they, they were doing all of the space planning and they had a lot of design boards in there. I don't, they don't have anybody. They've got to have somebody do it. They can do space planning. Obviously, they learn how to do that because it's a very standardized thing. Uh, so it's it's not like if if you gave them uh, you know the space planning for let's say a hospital they would know how to do it where an architectural firm would figure that out. So I don't know, but yeah, I, I'm sure the the relationship is long over with. I mean, here's a here's a conversation that I want to have. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this entire ideal org program being motivated by two things, David Miscavige wanting and needing to do something with money, needing to spend money on things so that to the IRS, they could continue to appear as a, as a public service. In other words, the, the, the whole focus of ideal of the ideal or division six is yes, to get people in to look at the displays, but they also have a thing in there called the new civilization, something or other where they can get you involved with what they call the so social betterment programs so that you can begin actively working towards raising moral standards, towards drudge education, towards raising, uh, erasing illiteracy. And in that sense, they can justify spending this money uh, as being for the public benefit because you cannot just accumulate money uh, when you're a nonprofit, but you can accumulate property if that property is then connected with being a public benefit. So a lot of people have said, you know, this was the whole motivation because Miscavige, he never really spent any money on, uh, on this. The money was all raised by parishioners. And then occasionally they would take money from what's called Sea Org Reserves or a grant from the IAS so they'd figure out some some economic, some financial instrument whereby they could use funds, but boy, they would always get paid back. And basically what they did was they loaned money to local parishioners to buy a building. And then the local parishioners would have to pay, pay it back. So the people who paid for the church never owned it. And once they moved in, they had to start paying rent. So it was really an amazing scam. So, oh, yeah. And so wow. a lot of people have said that was the whole rationale for it was just to expand the wealth of Scientology without looking like it was just becoming wealthier because the IRS doesn't like that. But I, and the conversation that I was referring to was, I'm not so sure that it didn't start out as a, as a really sincere effort on the part of David Miscavige to upgrade the oars, be able for Tom Cruise to take his girlfriends in if he ever gets one again, or, uh, you know, his producing partner or whoever, uh, and, you know, do expand boom science on, and it never worked. And so, in its failure, what does it look like? It looks like a big land grab. So I, I, I've never been able to puzzle my way through which was which, because he never, he always, you know, he's such a good con man like Hubbard that you, you always, he's never going to wink, wink, nod, nod, yeah, I'm doing this just to buy some buildings. He's never going to do that. So I think anyway, the, the ideal law program 
in my opinion, serves two purposes. One is money and two is public relations PR, right? Yeah. On the money front, yeah, like you say, the Scientology amasses huge amounts of wealth and it moves money around the world. Um, I've been talking a lot recently on my channel right. and on my website, ScientologyBusiness.com, about how money has moved around from the UK through Australia to the UK and uh, to the US, sorry. And there's loans of $100 million going on between right. Scientology International and the UK and so on. So they're moving lots of money around the place. Now, the the reason they're doing that is I'm not so sure about, and there are allegations of fraud and money laundering and this sort of thing. But property right. is a great way, as you say, of spending money, but also raising money. So, right. like as you said, you know, parishioners will raise the, the money to buy a building, right. and then the church will buy the building, but then the church or Sea Org Reserves or the IS will own the building. And right. so then the local church has to pay rent. Right. And there are a few instances where the local parishioners then fundraise again to buy the building back off of Sea Org Reserves. So then they own their own building and don't have to pay rent. Right. And things like this is like the only um, purpose it serves is fundraising for the church and being able to move assets around, which right. allows them to, on paper, um, you know, profit and earn money and you know save on taxes left right and center um, and right. so there's that money purpose right. but then there's the pr angle scientology can say we're expanding look how great we are yeah. to its parishioners because right. we've got so many scientologists we've had to open another building right right, right. look it's obviously right. growing because we wouldn't need to open another building if not and it's right. also protection longevity wise of like looks if we truly believe scientology is the only way to save the planet and we are going to expand and so on then we need the facilities to be able to do that right. so we're being forward thinking and preparing and planning and having a building that will cater for getting thousands of people to be clear um rather than being constrained by these little properties that aren't big enough to get 10 scientologists up the bridge so it's kind of a PR yeah. thing to its own parishioners. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I'd like to, uh, yeah, exactly. But and I, I'd like to just uh, redefine what you mean when you say PR at the parishioners. It's internal marketing. Yes. And, and and you and I have talked about this before in relation to marketing and advertising that all of the marketing the Scientology does, everything from ads they play on the Super Bowl. I, I refuse to call them Super Bowl ads because they're not. They're just ads they make that they happen to show on the Super Bowl. All of that, everything is directed at its internal public to say, look how great we are. Look at what our messaging is to the public. Like one of those, uh, you know, the commercials on the Super Bowl. Nobody understands those in the public. They're completely dense and arcane and they're word salad. But to a Scientologist, it looks like, you know, like look at the last one. The message of it was rise. Like, yes, the people out there, they're pieces of mud and they need to know that they can rise. It's just an insulting message. So if you're in the audience in an event, whoa, look at the message we're giving to the world. But they don't know. They're just bubbled. And that message is actually being redirected it's to, for them. And they just don't know it. And I know that because I used to make these things. And I used to sit there and, and, and envision how the audience would react, never even thinking that I was marketing to the audience because I hadn't really figured it out yet. But I knew I needed to make something that, and the scavenge would like and that the audience would go crazy for so we were just, it's all just made for them you know it's like there's some really good advertising that does not work for the internal public it only works yeah. for the new guys so, but they don't do that anyway i just i had to throw that in because there it's a component of the ideal org program it's mm. it, it makes miss scavenge look like his stats are up which in terms of square footage they are and it makes the internal public like oh my god we're taking the world over and it shows that they're taking this seriously, right? right. And it's not a laughing, joking um, matter. Right. For example, the e-meter, um, you know, Scientologists use this little e-meter that looks like an easy bake oven. You hold these cans and it's, you know, you use this as a tool in your therapy sessions called auditing um, they redesign the e-meter every so often and the old e-meter um, was the one that I used a lot to go book selling to do stress tests and right. so on um, right. which looks like this if I bring up my uh, share screen here so this is actually taken in London this is the old e-meter they redesigned it 
um, to make it look all space age and cool, which is this is the new e meter that they mm. came up with. Um, and this was released when I was on staff, actually. Um, right. But, it, you know, there are a few differences in terms of the way it works, but ultimately it does the same thing. Um, but the whole point is the rumor that was started when I was on staff was we've hired the same designers that design stuff for Apple because we need this to be the most perfect, wonderfully designed, wonderfully functioning machine because that's how serious we are about this. But that's a lie and it's just a PR tactic. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just in, in all fairness, I, it was designed by a company called Boombang. At least they did a lot of the work on it. And they may have done something for Apple, but I don't know because... You know, it doesn't matter because they, it, this was not designed by people who did anything for Apple. Do you remember what year this the Mark Eight was uh, released? Do you remember what year that yes. was? Yes. Yeah. Two thousand fourteen, I think. Two thousand fourteen. Okay, the first time I saw this meter was two thousand five. <laughs> this is something Mark Headley has talked about yeah. before. Actually, yeah. it was it was designed. I think Mark was in the room when I saw. Yeah. Yeah. And they were made and ready to go, and they've just sat in oh, the warehouse. Oh yeah, forever. Yeah. yeah. Plus, yeah. they're made in. They're made in. Uh, they're made in Taiwan for about a buck three eighty. Are they? Yeah, they're actually made in Taiwan. There's a few little finishing things, and I think the final software is loaded in LA. But the basing meter themselves are their Chinese manufacturer. So, and well, they are sold to Scientologists for five thousand dollars. Yeah, I think. And you have to buy yeah. two. You're not allowed to just buy one. Yeah, well, you got to have a backup. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, what happens if, you know, it's the end of the world and you haven't finished yeah. your session and the meter goes down. What do you know about the uh, the design process with that? You mentioned this company, Boom Bang. How well, I remember, happen? I remember uh, we were in a meeting and Ms. Gavin, Mark might have even been there. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. But um, we saw a bunch of design sketches. And, uh, okay, so if you look up... 2005 Ford Taurus. <laughs> I'm pretty sure because it's based on ovals. Back in the mid, in, in those 2000s, around 2005, the you know automotive, the automotive industry uh, design, automotive design. It okay. It's based on ovals. There's ovals everywhere if you look on the car. Uh, it might have actually even been an earlier one, but it's very. Okay, so more of the Easy Bake Oven, the e Mark 8 was more based on the really shitty looking, uh, you know, early 2000 Ford Taurus because the people that designed that were some of the first ones to work on it, right? And I remember, yeah. uh, and they sold Biscavish this thing about how it worked on these harmonious series of, of complementary arcs and, and ovals and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And um, I thought, I mean, I thought the thing was hideous when I first saw it. Uh, but then eventually they turned it over to Boombank. I mean, it, they did do some very intelligent uh, design things with it in terms of tactile because you have to operate it without looking at it. But the body of knowledge on tactile design was so massive. That all they did was kind of, you know, take a few thimblefuls of it and apply it to the thing. It wasn't like some big old breakthrough but yeah it but was it felt like a breakthrough like i remember when the new e-meter was revealed in an event like there was an audible gasp at, yeah do you remember that London really World. cool video with all the little the, yeah that you did yeah <laughs> i did that video yeah it was honestly when that was played we were like oh this is yeah. so cool it's a new e-meter we're being really open with the world about what we actually do because we're showing them in this advert the yeah, e -meter yeah. for the first time and yeah. it looks really space age like we're cool man scientology is finally like out there and doing good work yeah, and yeah, cool yeah. stuff i know i know it was amazing it was amazing and I, I remember that i did the you know miscavige really wanted what he called a release video for event release so we did some motion control and some of the shots that I wanted to do were impossible to do. So we did them with computer generated imagery. And he was like, I don't want to do that because people might believe it's not real. You know, of course, then I shot it with a Milo, you know, the motion control thing. And yes. It didn't look, it didn't look any different than the CGI, but so uh, I was great. I love it. It's approved. We'll put it on the shelf. This is, this is a, a true fact in Scientology work, working up at gold. If you do something and it's loved, like, four thumbs up and then it goes on the shelf if a certain amount of time goes by it's usually three years and it doesn't get released it'll be rejected like it'll absolutely be rejected so they took it down three years later 
looked at it and was, nah, we got to redo it. So I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So I did another one. The one that you saw was like the second one because the first one was, uh, you know, it sat so on the shelf for too long. Yeah, which is crazy. Wow. But yeah, I remember that was a big deal. But it was, and then you talk about it costing $5,000, but remember the special editions? Yeah. Like when, when I was at Scientology Media Productions, they had their own edition, the, science, the, so, the Disseminators edition. It was 15 grand. Yeah, they were trying so, to get me to buy one. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> so every gonna, org I'm in the gonna... world has its own color scheme, right. right? So I showed the red ones earlier because red was London org's color. Right. So all of the e meters in the building were red. We weren't allowed to have any other colored e meters right. because red was our color. And every org has a different color. And then there are the special editions. There's like a gold one, a silver one. There's a um, like a black Chrome onyx mirror. one. Yeah, yeah. The, they and they do look really cool. And they go upwards to you know fifty. Oh no, the, grand the or finishes. The finishes on yeah. these things are amazing, like automotive paints. Yeah. They're absolutely spectacular. Some of the special edition ones they painted in the painting department at gold because those guys were really good at painting. They uh <laughs> sorry, I had to bring this comment yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, I try not to do I mean we're we're 50 minutes in. I think it's okay, huh? We're good, yeah. Yeah, I um, think should we start tackling some of these questions? Because I know you gotta yeah, wrap sure. up soon because you're going live. Yeah, let's, um, yeah, let's Mark, yeah. Think. Um, Lauren S, thank you for your super chat. Um, I don't know if it, this was discussed in the beginning, but with the tax exempt status being revoked in the UK, will these be <laughs> buildings be sold? Um, I, so I, I need to clarify here a little bit. The tax exempt status hasn't been revoked. They never had a tax exempt status here. So yeah. in 1999, yeah. Scientology applied for tax exemption here in the UK. They were rejected uh, because they couldn't prove that they were for the public benefit. Um, and after a Freedom of Information Act request, I submitted to the Charity Commission last month. They got back to me the other day and said too much time has now passed for them to be able to appeal that rejection. <coughs> Excuse me. So if they want to apply again, they can. They can submit a new application, but they would be subject to the same review process they right. were 25 years ago. And we stand by our decision. They are not for the public benefit. And uh, therefore, you know, they're going to have to start again, basically from scratch. So they haven't lost anything. It's just made it very difficult when they do want to apply for tax exempt status. So, right. no, their buildings won't be sold. They are still very much here and they are paying taxes on them. They did. Um, win some minor tax victory on their property tax earlier this year which is a whole other story i did a video on it uh but no they're not selling their buildings at all that would be a very very last resort thing that they well, won't do unless they're about to die i'm sure that that property tax little small victory you mentioned will be blown up at an event into we have conquered the british isles so hey, without a doubt without a doubt yeah i reckon at the next ies event because that's the next big one on the calendar right yeah, 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 the, yeah, and it's in England too. So yeah, perfect. Yeah, somebody here mentioned actually, L. Ron Hubbard mentioned uh, that the, the, there's a special edition rainbow meter, and I just want to note that uh, in the book of things you'll never see is the Mark Eight LBGTQ Plus edition. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you will never see that. That won't happen. They they're no. they're so anti-gay. It's disgusting. Um. Rev girl here, remember bodies in the shop? Yeah, so this is a term that used to be used to when we used to body route people in to come and look at the org and walk around the information center. It's a statistic that staff are measured on. Um, and it just means how many people came and looked around the church, but it's called bodies in the shop, which I think just right. says a lot about Scientology. Yeah, um, for sure. Local color, you can build a beautiful building, but if the idea is taught and it stink, you fool. Scientology proves that. Right, right. Which I think is a fair point. Jenna from Cali. I don't understand. Scientology has so much money. Why isn't every place perfect looking? Well, they're trying. Their ideal org programs is exactly their strategy to do that. Yeah, I mean, um, they, they've they kind of solved that. I mean, the how many ideal orgs are there? There's uh, 30, over 30, right? I don't know how many there are. It's going to be, I thought it would be more like 100. It could be. Maybe it is like 100. I just know when we redid the orientation film, the first film everybody has to see and then sign an affidavit that they did see it and they know that Scientology is a religion. They know what they're getting into. When we made that film, um, 
the end of the film, uh, or not the end of the film, but there's a point in the film that has a montage of all the ideal orgs. And, you know, first when it was like 10 or 20, it was a really nice piece. But then it started going on and on and on. And it got so long, I couldn't believe it. And I told Ms. Gavage, I said, you know, at a certain point, just start putting them multiply on the screen. Put five, put 10, put 20. Like, it's too long. And it, it, they never did it, I think. I, it was like a couple of minutes of just watching buildings roll by because, you know, he was so proud of each of them. But I think that they have, they do have a lot of buildings because they do have a lot of money. So I, I don't think that's true anymore. They, they, uh, they, but they haven't that. opened any new ones. You know, Dave Miscavige no, announced the, in the event at the beginning of the year that they were going to open the Chicago ID Org in the yeah, first quarter. Of this yeah, he year, said four. He said four in the first quarter. And that never happened. No, it never <laughs> happened. And this is the first time. Yeah. Lauren S., thank you for the super chat. Oh, wow. Even crazier. Yeah. That's so it's, 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 it's That's the first time he ever missed the target. I mean, I the last one I went to, and you kind of had to go to them if you could. I mean, I was working at Scientology Media Productions. Like, you get hauled into ethics if you didn't go. Yeah. Like, literally, like, well, why weren't you there? It, especially with the HCO group around Scientology Media Productions, because they were particularly virulent about ethics, uh, having been, you know, tra flag trained, you know, they or whatever, that's the whole story. But uh, the last one that I went to was in February, was that 2020 or 2019, Ventura, Ventura, California. And that's, yeah, I think it was 2019. That was the last one, maybe even earlier than that. I don't know. But, I just remember Ventura is a, a, a part of the Southern California coast between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, which like much of the, Santa, the, the, the California coast is extremely protective of sea life. Like, and rightly so. They're extremely protective of the condition of the coast and of the sea life. And Ventura is particularly, like we shot up there a lot and we would shoot at the surf beach where like you can surf here, but don't even walk down there. You know, they're, and so at this uh, uh, Ventura opening, they did a balloon release and it blew up. Do you remember that? Did you hear about that? No, I didn't. Oh, the balloon release because... Because it ended up in the sea. It ended up on the coast. Oh, no. It ended up did in they get fined? Oh, yeah. They got, they got nuked for this. It was in the newspapers. And the thing is, is that they said, but we very specifically use biodegradable materials the balloon material it takes 20 years to degrade. Okay, so it was the second they released it, wow. I was sitting in the audience and I just cringed and I went, <laughs> No, they didn't do that. Please tell me they didn't do that. They didn't do that. We're like 400 yards from the Pacific coast, from the ocean. Oh, no. They didn't do that. You know, and people are pulling turtles out of the ocean with straws stuck up their noses and horrible stuff and killing Jeez. sea life with plastic bottles. And we're like doing a balloon release. Anyway. <laughs> they do shoot themselves in the foot a lot, don't they? Yeah, a lot. And it's because nobody wanted to tell Miss Gavage, no, we can't do it. Yeah. Nobody yeah. wanted to say we couldn't get a permit. They didn't have a permit, which was they one of very the rarely do. problems. Well, no, uh, they, they will if they can, they'll get it. You know, when we opened CCHR, we had to shut down two blocks of Sunset Boulevard. That takes a year in advance, but you know, we we didn't just show up there and do it. They'll they'll, they'll get permits and stuff, but I think it's uh, becoming harder and harder. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> PTS for life here, Jeff Beaumont. If you haven't already, check him out. He's uh, just started a channel, um, SPTV channel. He used to be staff at uh, Vancouver Org, and then uh, he was kidnapped and trafficked as a child from Canada to LA to go and work for um, the Sea Org. His dad was the executive director of CCHR, um, which is Citizens Commission of Human on Human Rights um, right. for Canada. Um, he's a really lovely guy, and he's just started speaking out. Uh, so go check his channel out if you haven't already. But he yeah, says Vancouver, uh, Vancouver has been raising money for 20 years, and they are still in an old crappy building with no yeah. building purchase, as far as I know. That's, that is the yeah. state of the ideal law program in today's world. That's the reality. Yeah, it's pathetic. Scary Mac, there's only about 22 Scientologists in Manchester. The building will collapse before they raise enough money to renovate it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you never know. Somebody could win the lottery. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, there's a question here for you from Jenna from Cali. Yes, please look at what Goldie is saying about Mitch. He needs some help with his book. Tell us about your book, Mitch, and oh, what help you need. Uh, it's almost done. Uh, what I need is to get off of YouTube so I can finish it. But, <laughs> but it's too much fun. Um, 
what do I need? Oh, I just I was just raising a couple thousand bucks because I, I was going to do everything myself, uh, but it's really time consuming. So I have I have a book designer and someone who's going to format the files, and you know I just it's a lot easier because they, you know, one of the uh, interestingly enough, I'm working with people that used to do books for the Church of Scientology. And you know they they I'm sure they would love to just volunteer their time, but they can't. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's that's what I need. You can go to Indiegogo, and people have been very generous. I, it was only I, I put up a campaign for two thousand bucks, and I'm at fifteen hundred. I mean, the next day I had twelve hundred bucks. It was amazing. People wow. were very generous, and I'll get it done. I'm I'm shooting for the end of October. Another delay has been two people I connected with, actually three. One of them who had some very interesting material about what was going on behind the scenes when I was being, you know, invited on a date with Scarlett Johansson that <laughs> it turned out to be her ugly uh, stepsister. Well, and I got that's lost. That's a story the for another stream. I need no, to No, no, no. I'm that. just, I'm, that's a, that's a metaphor. I'm, I mean, I'm, everybody <laughs> knows I'm joking, right? Uh, but anyway, it was kind of a bait and switch on what, it's a funny, we can talk about it sometime. So I, I gathered some, I found out some really informa interesting information about the lay of the land that, that put them in a position to say, we need to hire some professionals to come up here because they had just priorly done this kind of purge. I spoke about it with Caroline Mustard a little bit the other day where they really wanted to get rid of all the pros and not work with pros. And they were worried about outside influences. So they did exactly what Hebert said and they just completely failed to get anything done. And, and this is such a great example of why, uh, you know, doing what Ron said, which is a motto in Scientology. Alex, did you ever see how to set up a session in the e-meter, the technical training film? Did you ever Probably see Probably a while ago, though. It's about the one in Africa. It's, uh, at the yeah. end of the film, there's a mess messenger, uh, L. Ron Hubbard messenger, and he looks sort of off to the camera, uh, and he says, clowns, when will they ever learn? Doing what Ron says makes things always come out right. Do what I mean, Ron I, says. Yeah, and uh, he wrote, of course, Ron wrote this himself, so he was not a narcissist. But so <laughs> the fact that they had to bring me up there and other people, and now they're at S Scientology Media Productions, and they have all these pros working there, is because they tried it, doing it exactly what Ron said, and they just fell on their faces. And, you know, Miscavige, although he alters a lot of what Ron said, everything he says, everything he does is based on something Ron said. Even the Ideal Org program, he supposedly Ron did say they will know us by our mess, meaning they'll know us by our, what we, our physical presence. Mest is matter, energy, space, and time. That yeah. means the physical universe, basically. Yeah, it's your stuff. It's just yeah. your stuff, your house, your car, whatever. And that's, uh, they'll know us. Yeah. So um, anyway. Um, Demetri yeah. here. Great question. Thank you for the super chat. Any info on Austin Ideologue? Uh, I, I don't know anything. Nobody does. I mean, I think they tried to do it and then they pulled the plug. They, they did have an opening schedule. I was read about it in, the, in somebody's blog. Maybe it was Tony Ortega. They had it scheduled. They had a permit and people were saying the day, if you check the weather, that that day was the worst day you could possibly pick because it would have been so hot. Um, Mitch, Elrond do what Hubbard I says, say. <laughs> Don't bring the book out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So he's. Yeah. That's a very. He's on it. Yeah. He's on yeah, it. Yeah. Thank you um, very much, Ron. Thank you for that. It's a great one here, Daniel Chamberlain. Um, when I was on the RPF at St. Hill, we were bussed overnight to do renovations in London Org in Tottenham Court Road. Then early sunrise, we would have to run laps um, up and down outside the York. Danielle, that is such an interesting story of how London Org came to be. Um, and considering I worked there, I had no idea that that is the the um, circumstance in which the building was built. And I've heard stories of, you know, Catherine Olson, who speaks out on YouTube about her experience in the US. She made like the sign that's above the door at the Scientology building in London. And she said it's got her initials on the back of it. There's lots of <laughs> stories like that that I'm learning now. Yeah. And I had no idea about when I was in Scientology. But Danielle, well, please email me. Hello, apostatealex.com yeah. if you haven't already. Um, I'd love to, to hear yeah, she, more about she, that. She needs to come on this and talk with you about that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember going back to the audio works? I don't want to I don't want to go back too far, but we were talking about Gensler and you were saying what an easy job they had. Do you remember all these photos and video? I used to see binders. Oh, 
Um, <laughs> Catherine could join if she wants. I know, but yeah. you've got to jump off soon, haven't you? Yeah, pretty soon. Like one thirty okay. latest, I have to get off. But you okay. remember seeing all those photos and videos of all this, the, the quote unquote Sea Org members? They were all on the RPF. And they were doing all the original demo before the real construction of the building started. They'd come in and they'd yeah. be tearing out the drywall and the windows and yes. you know, doing really dangerous work without proper gear, without face masks or goggles. Or it was pretty crazy. It's madness. But that's how Scientology operate. They may spend millions of dollars on hiring the uh, best. Uh, architecture firm or the largest architecture firm in the world um but they well, don't spend millions of dollars paying their staff to uh come and renovate and actually do the building right um, exactly Catherine, i just saw your message mitch has to go in 10 minutes so i'm gonna email you the link now yeah but i want to say jump hi in i want to say hi come minutes. on come on in Catherine. So okay sorry. come and join us i emailed you the link um but i'm not in any time pressure i can i can continue talking for forever and ever. But I think this is one thing that I, I want to get across in this video is the ID Law Program. They spend millions of dollars on renovating these buildings, hiring these companies to do it professionally, and then making glitzy videos of them. And look how great we are and how much we've expanded. But in reality, there are people on the RPF that are, you know, in a slave labor camp, painting signs to go in the ID Laws or making chairs or, you know, doing the space planning or whatever. And, and you don't realize that that's that's what's going into these buildings, which would be illegal yeah. in any normal commercial yeah. interior. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of these people, they're really trying to do good work. You know, I'm sure if Catherine, she can verify this. When she was painting that sign, she was putting her heart into it. It wasn't just like, yeah, I'm going to do some sloppy thing. You know, the, the signage that's in the building, you know, these beautiful signs they have like in the course rooms, these incredible sculptural signs, which they those come out of the tech films because we started designing those for uh, you know for to decorate the sets and, and the films and so they make those this, those are beautiful sculptural pieces and because they're specific to that org they're all one-offs and they're made at the, the dissemination center you know they have what's called the mill down there and most of the guys in there the men and women working in there were busted off of much more important post and he, that's what Catherine was doing yeah that's, yeah yeah and so she, they're making and, and I, i've been i've shot there i've made a story a documentary about it i've walked through there looked at their work I and mean, these people have a high level of artistic ability and they're doing this they want to get out of you know they, e even in that they want to do the best thing here she can. is hey, Catherine, hey. How are you? hey hey man yeah. how's, hey. how's it going I just saw you guys were doing this live. I was like, I want to be a part of this. Yeah, I I, I can stay till one thirty. <laughs> we were yeah. just talking about um about your work and doing the signs for London Org and yeah. um the mill and the distribution center. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I loved it. I wanted to work there permanently. But you you did you did the signs at the mill, right? You were at the mill. Yeah, I, yeah. I was at I was at the mill when the mill was in on the on the pack base. Before they moved to the oh you, you you not at Sheila we called it we used no. to call it Sheila oh you we no, were at the was pack a long base. time after right. that I wanted to go there I was actually trying to get there for a really long time yeah, it's a great, go it's, it's my a, mom was making noise <laughs> yeah I mean the, I was just mentioning that there's a lot of men and women working on that in, in, in on those kinds of projects like at the mill wherever it was where you when it was at Pack yeah. or at at the Sheila facility and the the artistic level is really high. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, you wouldn't know that these yeah. people are being old, just yeah. mistreated. Even within that context, they're trying to do a really good job because essentially they're really good people and they're idealists or they wouldn't even be yeah. in that situation. Yeah, everybody that worked there was really dedicated to it. And they were like, it was a bunch of artists and they loved doing yeah. it. So it's like, oh, we have to stay up all night doing this? Oh, that's fine. I'll stay up all night and paint. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. We wish they weren't staying up all night regging people. Yeah. That, that would have been <laughs> What was your experience like working in that field, Catherine? Of like, was it really clear you, someone said you need to make this and then you just went and made it, designed it and made it and so on? Or did you have more input in like the design of the spaces and the, with the landlord office and so on? No, everything was designed already. This was when, <clears throat> this was when the landlord office was, was at the ant base because later on it moved um down to, to ivar yeah that's right that's where they are now yeah. 
but this is where when the landlord office was still up there and i was actually on the epf at the time when i was working in there so i had no input whatsoever but but they made me after a while they just they just like made me in charge of the mill they're just like okay you 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 run the mill guys you do that and we're, we have to do this stuff over here because they were i found out later they were working on berlin at the same time oh yeah so yeah because all that stuff was designed at gold yeah. there were a couple of couple of decent yeah. designers who were yeah like it was it was designed at gold in Lambert office whatever and then and then and then they would <coughs> cut all the like 3d signage and stuff on the the cnc machine which is like cuts out all the sign foam right that, right and then we would pretty it up and sand it and paint it and yeah i wish you had I'm going to show an example of something actually. So yeah, this like is if, a project. If you could find one, but if you could find, there's one like in the academy, what's called the academy, which is in every church of Scientology. There's you a, show the door of London, Alex. Yeah. yeah well, or, well uh, let me just show you this first off. So we're this all is excited a, this to is show off our old this Scientology is a art project. projects. <laughs> this is a renovation project at St. Yeah. Hill, the UK headquarters, and yeah, where they were adding the information center. So they spent £600,000 on building this little information center. Um, yeah. And you see these like big wooden blocks here that contain everything. Like This is the sort of stuff that's all custom made yeah. for every single org. Right. Um, like Catherine was saying here, um, you want to see. I made, a, I made a lot of those, those, those casings or whatever you call them. I made tons yeah. of those. Yeah. Yeah, like, for you sure. You know, when when I when I was done working on the Div Six Display Project and we turned it over to Gensler, we turned it over to their San Francisco office, who'd worked on Nike Town and the Apple Store. So I mean, they had some pretty serious people working on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so Gensler did the initial first few yeah. Apple stores, and then Foster and Partners took. Yeah, 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 that's right. They, they did. Yeah, the they, they, and they also only partially worked on Nike Town. I mean, to say that they, yeah, yeah but they they're did. huge. They're a huge architecture. Uh, this is the test center at London Org. Is it this sign that you did? Yeah, that or is it one above the ideal? Org? Unless they did a new one, but I, I did a sign exactly like that. Yeah, so that's the main one. Above, yeah, I mean, compare uh, that with the there. signage around <laughs> that also building. Did the, like, like the 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 insignia, the London insignia that's above the door of the org. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah. that, yeah. that was mine. Oh, wow. nice, nice. And you can see like all of these little um, here, the little. Uh, yeah, Scientology it, crosses with the little uh, English flags yeah, behind yeah. them, and this big one here, but in the reception area, they're huge and they're all custom made. Right. Yeah. That's right. By right. people like you, they have, they, they have more of a. It's it's more automated now that they're in a different facility. When I when I was working there on the on the pack base, it was a lot of hands on. Yeah. Like, well, now being, and now it's like. Yeah. When they when they moved to to the Desem Center to Sheila, they this got is the one Academy of those, at London. Oak. Yeah. Right. They got one of those. Yeah. Look at the signage in there. It's just amazing. I know. But they got one of those. C it's not a CNC machine. It it's like a CNC machine, but it it cuts with water, yeah, with jets right. of water. It's the that's one right. that they use to make yeah. like the MacBook Pros. You know the, which Apple did a whole movie, a, a whole documentary about how they make the casings for the MacBook Pros. That's how they make this signage. They have the same machine. Yeah, it's super mm. precise too. Yeah, look at the sign on the back of that ch chapel. It's like. Oh, hold on, I can open that up again. Yeah, Sorry. That, that's, a, that's a perfect example. Stone or glass. Or, yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. stuff's all done by hand. It's automotive paints. Amazing stuff. There's and actually a great. secret room behind this wall. The yeah, London and, story. For yeah, you. and look how many people are in the audience. Oh, I know, right? Uh, you can, you can. These panels move across and reveal like a big projector screen, yeah. and then just behind yeah. this side here, there's a little door, and behind this is a tiny little pokey cupboard um, where they have like a plastic machine where you can pull out. The, used to be my favorite job. Pull out this plastic on a roll, stick a Dynetics book in it, and then like shrink wrap it so that it oh, looks all new again. Yeah. That was like the funniest thing. Yeah. But, and it was in the same room behind that with hundreds of PC folders. Um, the wow. folders for people was oh, auditing. Wow, so nice. I would spend hours and hours in this room with unlimited access. <clears throat> I could go and grab a, any of these people's PC folders and look through them that I wanted to. I never did because <laughs> I was a good Scientology boy that never would have done that. But um, it yeah. was very easy it's to Scientology get access to boy. personal. Yeah. <laughs> personal information yeah today if you want to read your folder you could just go look at on the internet just yeah. Yeah, practically yeah well look mitch i know you've got to go in a couple of minutes so before you do i just wanted to say thank you so much for oh you're really uh, welcome 
for joining me on this. Yeah, I thought yeah, you guys fantastic. had already been going for an hour. I miss I missed the whole thing. I was like, oh no, they're talking about ideal <laughs> orgs. I want to go talk about well, it. Well, thanks for joining us. It's great to see you, Catherine. Yeah. yeah. We'll all have to do something together. So uh, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm we should do another there. thing like this together after. Thank after you after. for everybody who joined to, to see me and Alex, not just Alex. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. And I'll see yeah. you guys soon. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, guys. Yeah. If you want to support the channel, you can buy Mitch a coffee, you can buy me a yeah. coffee, like, subscribe, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and if you're um, ever in Studio City, I'll buy you a real coffee. Studios. I promise. I'm down. I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. thank you so much, guys. Yeah. See, see you next you later. time.